This interview is brought to you by Encyclopocalypse. Check them out in the link in the description. Hi, this is Tom Holland, writer-director of Fright Night and Child's Play and Thinner and uh, Tales of the Crypt and a lot of other stuff. And you are watching Slasher Pepper. Please watch and listen and enjoy it. Hey guys, Slasher Pepper and welcome to another video. Today is another interview and this time with Tom Holland. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thank you very much. Awesome. So glad to have you on the show. Um, and my first uh, question was, do you have any new projects uh, you're working on right now? Maybe any new books? Yeah, well, I've, 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 I've got two that are up on, on Amazon, one called The Notch and the other one, a collection of short stories called Domestic Disturbances. But I have started a, I own, a, a, a Fright Night was an original so when I made the deal for the movie, I held back literary and dramatic rights. So I own the literary, literary rights, the rights to musicals or plays. And I am two novels into a, into a trilogy of Fright Night novels. And I'm, I'm doing the, I did two and three first, and now I'm doing the first one called Fright Night Origins. And then I hope to have, I hope to be able to release them as a trilogy. And uh, if they're uh, successful, I'll, I'll continue the story of Charlie Brewster and Amy Peterson and Evil Ed Thompson. Very so awesome. that's what I've, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm busier now than I've probably been in 20 years. It's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And what happened to um, Friday Night Resurrection? Like, was that, um, because I saw it up on a lot of websites, but it seems to be sold out everywhere. Well, I, I pulled it down because it, it, how do you say this? What I learned from the publishers was that they would prefer to have a series of books as opposed to just one big book. Right. So I started working on it and, and I've ended up with a trilogy. And okay. that, that seems to, way, to be the way that the publishing industry is right now. Yeah. And, uh, I'm learning more and more about about publishing as I go along because I I got my first book published, The Notch, and it got very good reviews, and I was thrilled. And it opened right into the face of of, of COVID. Yeah. And it, it it I got a great review in the Publishers Weekly, and it would have sold the libraries, and all the libraries shut down. So I mean, so much of this business, any creative endeavor including film is a matter of timing and yeah, sure. who the hell ever knows. And uh, all you can do is just keep on trying. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. So, so, but I mean the, a film, if you write a screenplay, it's not the thing itself. It's a blueprint for a film and the film is the thing itself. However, if you write a novel, that is the thing itself. And so what I've been thinking, what I started to think is that I, I do better writing my stories in novel form, and then hopefully they'll get made as movies. But at least I'll have, I'll have my story out there as a novel, and nobody's going to be interfering with it, and it's going to be exactly as I imagined yes. it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And when do you think um, like these, this trilogy of books will be out and like, will there be a month or a year in between? No, I, well, here, here's, here's your problem. The, uh, I, I think they'll all be ready by Christmas. All right. But the way it works, if you make a deal with a major publisher, then you go on the carousel, which is all the books that they have slated before you. And they're working uh -huh. one, two, three years out. So that's an argument for not going with a major publisher and self-publishing if you want to get it out there quickly. However, if you have a publisher, a major publisher, then you have somebody taking care of all the distribution yeah. and the printing, and, and it leaves a lot more time for writing as opposed to getting into the business of publishing. So I don't, I don't know which way it'll go with the notch the first book that I had published, I made the deal with Cemetery Dance, the publisher, and it took them a year and a half after I made the deal 
to get the book out there. And I thought they were great and they did a beautiful job. You can find it on, on Amazon, collector's edition, autographed and all of that. But it, it's too long to wait a year and a half, yeah. you know, at, at this point in my life. So I'm, I'm ambivalent and I'll worry about it when I finish the third book, which I'm doing now. And because I've got the other two written already and waiting. But I know also from dealing with the publishers and my literary agent in New York that they would prefer a trilogy as opposed to one. Yeah, see, I see. Well, that's and that. You see that with The Witcher. You see it with, uh, with so many that there are series. You know? Oh, yeah, for sure. Most definitely. Like Harry especially Potter. In that, yeah. Especially in that, that business, I feel. And what what is like the biggest difference that you've noticed so far with like writing screenplays uh, as opposed to writing books and novels? Well, with screenplays, you're you're limited in terms of the how how, how long the story can be. Right. Uh, it's a very condensed form. When I first started out and started selling, which would be the late seventies, nineteen. The first big hit I had was a TV movie called Initiation of Sarah, and the year was 1978. And then, you know, then I then I went into screenplays. The I could you could write 115, 117 pages. Now, in uh, 2021, they're trying to get them in as close as they can to 100 pages. So, I mean, because the, I, I, I suppose because the, 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 the attention of the audience is, is decreasing. Yeah. But I mean, I mean the, the whole business is, uh, is in a, 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 a period of huge change. And oh, yeah. everybody, everybody thinks they know what it's going to, which is streaming. But I, I don't know how you're perceiving it in Hollywood. But what it feels like to me is, is this, it's a tsunami of 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 product of 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 video of film whatever you want to call it and it's very very hard to find out what's good or what you'd like to see there still isn't an effective way to separate out the stuff that really works from stuff that's sort of general run of the mill and to be critical uh what movies do is they, because it's a one-off and because they have them, because they did have the marketing arm of the major studios behind them, it popped out what was the best. And now with the streamers, you have so much product being delivered every month that it's just very, very hard to tell what, what's really good or what you'd like. Yeah. There still isn't an effective way of uh, of winnowing out the mediocre from the excellent. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I, I feel like um, with streaming, it's so well uncertain, kind of what's going to happen in the future, and like also with social media, it seems like you know back back in the day, I feel like more teens would just go to the cinema in their free time, and now people watch videos on their phone you know there are like 30 seconds and yeah like everyone's attention um attention span basically is much shorter nowadays i feel especially with people my age and sometimes i even notice it myself that when i'm watching a movie sometimes i'll just grab my phone i'm like i should not grab my phone i should give all my attention to the movie you know and i feel like um that that's happening more and more nowadays yeah well that you just said it and it's undoubtedly true. I mean, it's it. The, the 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 trick used to be trying to catch the gestalt in the in the culture, trying to 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 come up with something, and and you couldn't really you did it catch up with something that reflected what was going on in the culture at that moment. That's always been the argument for horror, because oh, yeah. horror is is the is is one of the least expensive genres to, to, to do and also uh, allows the possibility of the greatest financial return, which is, of course, wonderful. But 
it also because it, it's I don't mean to say cheap, but because it's not a two hundred million dollar Marvel movie, <laughs> most horror films there it has the horror has the ability to reflect what's going on in the culture very very quickly, and 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 it it it, it it's not going to ruin the company if it doesn't work. Whereas if you have two or three tent poles in a row. It, it does severe damage to the production company financially. Uh, oh, yeah. but, but none of this, you're right. The, the, the attention span is, is decreasing because you can watch it on your cell phone now. And, you know, but, but at the same time, they tried that with Quibi to do just 10 minute or 15 minute bites, and it was a disaster. You know, so that was that was the you know the I forget you know the Hollywood crew that did that, you know, tens of millions of dollars behind it, and people didn't want to watch just a fifteen minute show. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not sure what that what it means, but I mean, it's so hard finding, getting feedback or finding out what what echoes or responds with the culture or your generation, or for that matter, any generation, yeah. what, what speaks to it. And when it was, when it was movies and television, the marketing of the majors got the word out, Hey, go see this movie. It's terrific. And look at the grosses and you can see the, the critical uh, uh, acclaim. You know, all of that worked, and now that's all buried because of the, number one, the, the, the streamers are not transparent. They don't tell you what, what's being a big hit. They'll tell, yeah. you, they'll, they'll tell you that this, this Netflix show has them. This is the, the top five network net, Netflix shows this, this, this month, but some of them only last a week. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's, it's, it's very, it's very, very hard to know what's going on in the culture. Whereas when I was working in the eighties and nineties and the early two thousands, it was, it was, it was a lot easier to feel what was going on. And my, my feeling then is that the, the popular culture recycled every two, three, four years. Now, I don't know. Now it may be every six months. Yeah. And I find the, the, my, my, most, my most valuable commodity is time. You know, so what, what's happened? I mean, I'm guilty too. I'll, 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 I'll read about some show that I think sounds interesting and I'll go on a streamer and I'll watch it for 15, 20 minutes. But if it doesn't hold me, I'm gone. Yeah. And I never I never used to do that. I would watch a movie all the way to the end, good, bad, or indifferent. You exactly. know, but 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 now because I'm in the privacy of my own home, and now I'm now I'm sort of riffing, but it changes things. When you lose an audience, think what it does to comedy. What makes comedy work is being with an audience all of whom are laughing at the same jokes and that that lets you know how funny something is and how successful it is yeah it's a very very different reaction when you're sitting staring at your computer screen or your tablet or your iphone you know it, 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 I, am i laughing just because i find it funny or is this something that a lot of people would find funny? And also laughter is contagious. If you have 10 people behind you laughing, you'll tend to laugh too. Yeah. And that's, that's destroyed with, with, with the end of the comedy movie in a, in a theater. So there's, 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 there's huge change going on. I'm not so sure it's good. And since I'm riffing, I'll add one, one other thing. When I was your age, I love this, the, uh, <laughs> it used to be that movies were something special. They could, they could target a much smaller segment of the audience, whereas TV, television, was the great wasteland 
because the larger your audience, the more bland the product has to be, the less people it can upset because you want the largest possible audience. Yeah. In TV, it's for the it's for the advertisers because your money comes from the commercials. Right. But the same thing is happening now with the streamers and and also with feature films, actually, that when the audience was was your country, Holland or or just the EU or in my case, North America, you were making films that, that reflected that national culture now that you have streaming and you have the internet it's worldwide oh yeah so now you have to worry about am i am i insulting china yeah exactly you know, that's a great example of it but it it it, it, it it's you you know it's, it's why they keep pushing inclusiveness inclusiveness is a way of saying we're going to piss off the least amount of people yeah you know, so and what happens then is your product gets more bland and boring. Oh, yeah. So, it, you know, so there, you know, so, yes, uh, you 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 now have distribution worldwide, but you also have to make sure that that whatever you're doing uh, keeps the largest worldwide audience possible. I mean, I think that's. This is all part of the culture where they're where it's becoming you can see you can see it where the where the where the propaganda out of your mainstream media is less and less about individual countries. It's anti-nationalism, anti-populism, uh, because they're trying to sell to the world now. Yeah. Right. OK. Awesome. And like to go back to what you kind of uh, mentioned for a bit earlier, like diversity, that's like a very important thing now in filmmaking. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it all depends on what the project is. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, you've got you've got it now government mandated or at least here there are quotas on everything. You know, I mean, uh, I, I know this because of the unions that I worked with, the Writers Guild, the Directors Guild, SAG, the Screen Actors Guild. So they're, 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 they're telling you essentially who you can cast and who you can work with. Yeah. You know, and that on some level, that's creative death, you know, on another level, uh, it's terrific that, uh, any barriers to entry are coming down, but it, it, you have to judge it on the product. Oh but yeah. What's what's yeah. But what's happening is people get intimidated and they get frightened. And then what happens is they start playing it safe and the safer you get, the more boring, whatever you're doing is. Okay, that's 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 part of it. So I, I feel mixed about that. Uh, I think we're now in the second inning of uh, of inclusive diversity. So you know, I don't know which way it's going to go, but my experience is that talent is always in short supply, and. That's in every generation, regardless of uh, creed, religion, ethnicist, ethnicity, anything. It's just it's always hard to find talented people. Yeah. Uh, so you don't want to exclude somebody who might be a new voice or who might make something that that makes your head spin around. At the same time, in other words, you don't want to enforce mediocrity by insisting on diversity. But I don't know. I don't know how much that's happening because you'll also see terrific things coming out of uh, different of uh, different uh, uh, points of view and different voices. So you know, it, it's just it's 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 still in a state of flux that way. Yes. But 
you know, but at the same time, if, if, the, if the unions and the government have to mandate it, it's going to kill you because that's essentially controlling free speech. It's, uh, it's essentially limiting your imagination. Yeah. You know, and so, and then you can't discuss it in specificity because all that does is make arguments. And yeah. so you've, and because of, of uh, the cancel culture, everybody's scared to death, including me. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so I just, I just watch it and I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it, everything has good and bad to it. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm ranting on or I'm, <laughs> or I'm going on, but Hollywood movies have always been about, and we can put this nicely, have always been about romance and action. And that's a nice way of saying it's always been about sex and violence. Okay? Romance and action are softer words. Sex and violence are harder words. Yeah. But those those two things have always since 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 the first film, The Great Train Robbery, where the the guy pointed up the the, the 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 bank robber pointed a gun at the at the screen and fired it and everybody in the audience screamed yeah. and ducked <laughs> under their chairs just like 1905 or something like that before sound they hadn't even seen movies yet there was a, the very beginning one reelers but ever since then that's that's always been because people i guess it, the, those things are are, are violence and uh and romance or you know or or worldwide everybody everybody wants to love and be loved and uh everybody's interested in the opposite sex or the same or whatever you know same sex or whatever but everybody's interested in, in caring and at the same time action is is uh one of the great things that film makes work can do the the other thing that was the heart of of film since the very beginning was movie stars and right now this has been going on for 20 25 years hollywood has done its best to kill the movie star they i remember maybe in the earlier mid 90s Hollywood got tired of paying actors like Schwarzenegger $20 million for a movie. So they thought what they'd do is they'd go with tent poles. The money went into, uh, into uh, premier properties that could be sequelized forever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I, when I first came into business, sequels were looked down on. You know, a, a sequel was a was an indication that uh, that the creative juices had died. You know, I remember when I my first huge success was Psycho Two, and that's 1982. I'm sure before you were born. Yeah. The <laughs> the, the uh, people thought in 1982. People thought it was it was thought it was horrible that I was doing a sequel or writing a sequel to, to a movie, and for, to make it even worse, writing a sequel to a classic movie. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know now all they do are sequels. Yeah, they want the the built in audience that comes out of a successful brand, and that works for them sometimes. It's worked for them with Marvel. And it hasn't worked for them with Alien, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, so you, you know, so it, 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 any. The other thing that goes on is that movies, film, video, streaming, it's all about risk reduction. There, because the numbers, the the, this is not horror now, but I mean the bigger the bigger temples. <clears throat> it's all about covering the financial bet and doing everything you can to ensure that 
the gross receipts come in and you get your money back plus a profit. So there's a there's a huge push to uh, to get a built-in name, and that used to that used to reside with the actor, with with charismatic actors and actresses that the audience that the audiences loved and would pay to see, and that's been true since the beginning of film. Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, the people who started, you know, United Artists, but those people. People didn't, the, 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 the audience worldwide didn't care what they were in. They just loved those players. And now that's no longer true. Now they advertise the name of the movie or it's something from the Marvel Universe or it's, uh, you know, whatever. The, uh, but they've, they've done everything they can to, to limit the... Uh, the ability of the actor to sell it just on their name so they can pay them less. You see that reflected now in the fight between Disney and... Uh, oh, yeah, Scarlett Johansson. Scar Scarlett Johansson, yeah. But, I mean, that's what, that's what they're saying. She's one of the few... She's the number one female star right now. But they're saying, hey, we don't need you. We need, we need the Marvel name, you know, the Black yeah. Widow. Uh but by doing that, they've, they've, by taking out the charismatic actor, or limiting the number that, that achieved that, 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 that fame and that popularity, they've taken away one of their great selling points. And one of the things that, 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 uh, that, made, uh, that made for an audience, for a faithful audience to come to the movies but then of course they're not doing movies anymore yeah it's good it's going to be interesting to see whether or not movies survive and at the same time you have all this technological advance going on with virtual reality and augmented reality so you know but i mean it 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 at the same time it's making us all lonelier we're all experiencing, you know, we're all taking our entertainment more and more just by ourselves. Yeah. And it used to be that the movies were a social experience that worked so well because of the, of, of, because of the pleasure of sitting in a, in a, in a full auditorium yeah. and enjoying it with a lot of other people. That's what made comedy work. But it was also romantic because you could snuggle up to your girlfriend. Exactly. You know, and then, you know, maybe, maybe kiss a little bit. I don't know, <laughs> but, you know, but that was one of the great things about movies. And now all of that, it seems so much of what's going on, especially with a lot of it's digital driven, but is making us more isolated and alone. Your turn. <laughs> well, um, like this question actually fits up nicely with what you were talking about earlier about like sequels and, you know, property names. Um, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Chucky TV series? And did you see the trailer yet? Uh, I must have, yes. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell, but I wish them the best. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's turned, I think it's, I think it's the most remunerative of the horror icons at this point. No, I don't know, maybe Scream's in there. But Chucky certainly, you know, has become worldwide. Everybody, everybody all over the world knows Chucky, the killer doll. Oh, yeah. Uh, the great thing about it for me is that it will always, it's made uh, Child's Play into an iconic movie. And that's terrific. They'll be watching, they'll be watching Child's Play 200 years from now, long after <laughs> we're gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that, that's because it's become... Because the initial, the initial film and 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 the, the the character I created, Chucky, has gone on was so popular, and has has gone on through a, through any number of sequels. It wasn't able to support success in the theaters. They tried two sequels with theaters and it didn't return enough money, but it returned enough as a direct to video, and so now it's gone to, uh, I guess it's the Sci Fi Channel. Yeah. It's gone to a TV series. 
I, I wish them the best. I hope it keeps. I hope it. Ke- I hope it's a huge success and keeps going. And just make Child's Play more famous. Awesome. Guys, I just wanted to take a quick break to thank Encyclopocalypse for making this interview possible. It's a really great publication company. You should definitely check them out. They have a list of a bunch of amazing books. They're publishing novelizations. They're republishing novelizations. They recently did the Reanimator novelization. Uh, they republished it. It was a pretty rare book, as far as I know. But they republished it, and now it's available for cheaper. So if you want to read that novelization... You can buy it from them, um, but they're also doing truly <laughs> God's work because they are publishing novelizations to movies that never even got novelizations. You know, Wishmaster, that you know movie that came out in the late 90s, I think? They did a novelization to that years after the movie was released. Like, that's truly God's work as a novelization fan myself, and I'm so happy I got to work together with them to get this interview possible. Um, they also have the Fright Night novelization republished. So, um, yeah, since you're watching this interview, you probably love Fright Night. You'll probably love the book. So get it from them. Link will be in the description. Enjoy the rest of the interview. Another TV show, this is one actually that you worked on. How did you get involved with uh, Tales from the Crypt? The, uh, I was a very, very hot director at the time. And they were just starting out. And uh, they asked me to do it, and uh, it was it was part of the part of the part of the, the part of the creative team was Dick Donner, and the director who just died just passed recently, and he was just a terrific a terrific human being and an extremely talented director, and we hit it off. Also included in that was Joel Silver, as the producer. And there were a couple of them. Walter Hill was in there directing, but it was it was really Dick Donner creatively, my memory. And uh, I got offered. I got offered. The, they, I think it was called Four Sided Triangle with Patricia Arquette. I think it was I did three of them. Yeah. Uh, and every one of they were just great. The underlying oh, yeah. material was great, but you have to understand. So you understand, I grew up on EC Comics. Yes. Okay. So Tales of the Crypt were like my guilty pleasure when I was in junior high school and I was like 11, 12, or 13. Now, to it's hard to imagine, but there was no horror in those days. You had. You had these. You had the AIP and the Hammer films, uh, which is where Fright Night comes from, with some god awful horror host, and they were like one film a week on Friday night at eleven o'clock on your local TV channel. Yes, <laughs> and, and otherwise there was no horror. And the scariest thing out you had you had the Victorian novels from like the late eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundred. And then you had the H.P. Lovecraft. But I think that I've just gone through the horror that was available to me when I was 11, 12, 13. Now, I'm the same generation as Stephen King. So if you look at his short stories, a lot of them are bouncing off of EC Comics. And so when they came up with Tales of the Crypt, and I had read all of them as a rabid fan, as, nice. a, as, a, as an adolescent. I mean, maybe I was even preteen. I can't remember. But, uh, you know, but yes, I jumped at the opportunity. And I, I, I did the rewrite on, uh, on Four-Sided Triangle, which I think is terrific still, Patricia Arquette. Then I went and I did the one uh, Lover Come Hack to Me. Yeah, that one is one of my favorites. Well, she's a terrific actress. Oh, yeah. Give me your, give me your name. Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember, but she's... Amanda Plummer. Yeah, she's great. Amanda Plummer. Too. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I just have a sensational and a wonderful human being. And then Dick and I did a pilot together called Two Fisted Tales. 
And I did half an hour and he did the other half hour. The pilot didn't sell and they put those two shows into Tales of the Crypt. And the show that I did is, is the pilot that ended up as Tales of the Crypt is about drag racing. And I, I found a, a very young actor uh, who came to me through a, live, through a video read. And I said, that's a terrific actor. Let's hire him. And it was Brad Pitt. And so I was one of the first directors to hire Brad Pitt. Nice. And yeah. And I remember trying to get him an agent. And <laughs> wow. He, yeah, no, this is true. And the agent I was with, who I won't name because it'd be so embarrassing, <laughs> but he said, I showed him the show and I showed him to, uh, 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 do you remember what the title was of that, of that two fisted tales show? The one about drag racing with Brad Pitt don't remember the name of that one anyway it, it, you can find it on youtube too yeah, i for think sure. but i mean you looked at it and brad smiled and all i had to do was look around the set and every woman was melting <laughs> the, the script girl was like ah you know and i said that that guy's a movie star <laughs> you know and he, and and, he, and also he was terrific to work with i mean he's talented terrific to work with but what he had he had this slow smile and it was, he was just so seductive to women, but it wasn't because he was trying to be, it was because he was. Yeah. <laughs> That's It's the same character he played in Louise and uh, whatever with the two girls car off the cliff. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Thelma and Louise. Yeah. Thelma and Louise. But that, that's the same character he played in the Tales of the Crypt. And he's one of the few examples that I've had in my working life where I worked with somebody, a new or beginning actor, and I said, that's a movie star, because that's how rare it is. But you could, you could I mean, guys liked him, but girls loved him. And you could, you could see it just from on, on the set, watching the reactions of the people watching him work. So awesome. anyway, so all three, all three shows I did on Tales of the Crypt, I'm terribly proud of. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the one that I did with Patricia Arquette is the four-sided triangle is just terrific. I mean, I got her at, I got her at the moment. She just had a baby. I think her first baby. And she was, she was incredibly hot. It's that, it's that, it's that, I don't want to say anything that, that isn't uh, uh, po politic. But, you know, with, 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 uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but with women, there is a moment when they're at their most attractive. And I swear to God, you can smell it on them. It's because, it's because they, 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 they're ovulating or, or whatever it is. They, they're, they're, they want to have children. I mean, it can happen at any age, but that was the moment in, in Patricia Arquette's life because she just had a baby and she was carrying this tremendous physical attractiveness, sexual attractiveness. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't because of any kind of acting uh, particularly sexual or, or anything like that. She just was at that moment. Right. And I think it was because she just had the baby and there was chemical in her and it came over on screen. So th that that's that was amazing, too. And Patricia, you know, not that's her. But I mean, Amanda Plummer is, is a sensational actress. So, I mean, I was very, very lucky. All three shows. Let's see. Patricia Arquette, Amanda Plummer and Brad Pitt. <laughs> How's that for three actors for your three shows? Yeah, that's you know? amazing. <laughs> Yeah. So those are the, the, the tales of the crypt was so much of it with Dick Donner was the one who wanted to split the uh, the pilot with me that ended up being the Brad Pitt show. I mean, so much so much of it is Roger is fate. You know, I mean, it's not because you plan. You yeah. can't plan it. All you no, can do of is not. No, all you can do is is get out there and, and do as much as you can. You know, when I when I was starting out, it was very, very hard to uh, to. Uh, 
it was almost impossible to make a film. It was so expensive. It was so difficult. I went to Northwestern University and uh, I went there and I, I went there as an actor and I became an actor because there was no place to get into film or to become a director right. or to learn about screenwriting. There, there, there was, there was, there was Northwestern film uh, uh, theater school. There was Carnegie tech theater school. And then they had a graduate school at, at Yale for, for theater. Juilliard came later. So there was, and I went there and I, and I dug up their, their, their film department it was one small, uh, a room and they had a 16 mil camera and they it was cold splicing which you did by hand you wore white gloves and then you you, you glued together the pieces of film when you cut them and i went out and i made my first film and we got what they called short ends from commercial from from people who were shooting commercials in chicago which were the cheapest pieces of film we could get and you you get you maybe you get a two or three minutes worth of film in a in a in a, in a where you could put 10 minutes in but you get into the into the canister but you know you just took whatever you get because it was cheap and i made my first film and it wasn't because i, I didn't i don't think i had any dialogue in it but <laughs> i what i did was i took my motorcycle i drove my motorcycle over the side of the hill and i spent and I spent the time trying to shove the motorcycle back up the hill and get it on the road and get it started. And I must have I must have shot like an hour's worth of film trying to make a short about that <laughs> with, with no dialogue. But I learned. Yeah, I learned about something about angles and I learned how to cut the pieces together. So but that was all that was all you could find. This is the early 60s. That was all you could, that was, that. there were no film schools. There was no way into the business. There was no way, I'm from, I'm from a small farm town in this state, New York, called Highland, New York. Nobody in the business, nobody interested to think about going to Hollywood and making films was like, you know, like going to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people, people could never imagine. I, th I would think my position is probably a little bit like yours is, look, you're doing this because you're learning and you're meeting people and you're, you're getting different experiences. Yeah. But in this somewhere is a way in and everybody's got their, everybody's got their own journey. So, you know, so, well, anyway, so anyway, I'm, 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 I'm I was thrilled with the, God bless Dick Donner for getting me into Tales of the Crypt. Oh, yeah, most definitely. That's awesome. And uh, another film I really like of yours is uh, Thinner. Can you tell me more about that movie? I, I was working on that one. Well, tell me what you like about it. Ooh, um, I just like it's a very unique story, you know? It's, um, I watched it at a time when I was watching where I felt I was kind of watching the same sort of horror movie tropes. And then like I saw thinner, I think I saw it when I had Amazon prime and I watched it on there and I was like, you know, this is something truly unique and different. It kind of reminded me of, you know, another Stephen King film, the night flyer, you know, the, the night flyer and thinner are both kind of, I mean, they're completely different movies, but they're both pretty unique, you know? Okay, believe it or not, hold on. My dog's going crazy outside. Let me see what it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got a new German shepherd and nice. uh, named Finian, which is an Irish name. And that was the gardener outside. And the dog went off because of the, of the mower, because of the, right. uh, the sound. And he's a handsome, handsome dog. And I got him because... I've had my property broken into twice now Wow! in the last three or four months. Wow. You know, three with, or four with, months. Yeah. I mean, I've been here for years and had no problem. And then just in the last three or four months, I've had two people break onto the property and both of them were, were, were dope addicts. Both ah. of them were, were addicted. And, uh, it, 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 it scared the hell out of my wife. 
Yeah, I bet. You know, and I've had, a, I've, I've had, now I've had three German shepherds, but I just got this one and I've been training him. The, the one of the pleasures, you have a dog? I don't, but I would love to have one later. Okay. Well, let me tell you, they're, they're, they're one of the, ple- I think they're one of the pleasures of life because they're, you, once they bond with you and you with them, it's a real relationship. And if you get a dog that, 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 that you know, is uh, protective, shall we say, uh, you know, they, uh, well, you just heard, they protect you. Oh, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, but when, 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 when we had two people, you know, heavy, heavy, I, I, I found... I, I found somebody halfway up my driveway smoking coke, smoking crack cocaine, or whatever it was in the pipe. I have no idea. That's crazy. And, oh well, she couldn't. Uh, she, the only person she could talk to was herself. Right. Is, is that happening with you in the Hague? Are you having that kind of problem? No, not really. <laughs> well, it's something that's going on in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has been getting worse and worse and worse over the last five or six years with homelessness. And they call it homelessness, but so many of them are addicted, you know, yeah. so it's, it's, it's just gotten difficult. Anyway, anyway, Finian, he's, 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 he's planted in front of the, in front of the door, looking out and watching the gardener, <laughs> uh, but hopefully he won't go off again. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, like, I'll give you about 10 or 15 more minutes and then we have to call it a day. Yeah, sounds I, good. The the uh, 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 thinner was I thought was a really interesting short story. It wasn't. It was a character story, and it 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 it's a difficult story because it has what they call a downer ending. But the theme is moral jellyfish gets squished in the end, which is not something that the average film goer wants to see. But I thought it was a chance for 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 really terrific acting. And, I, and Robert John Burke, who played Billy, did a terrific job in it. It was not a success in the theaters. And what happened was the audience loved the film into the last five minutes. And then they found out that Billy lost. And the yeah. a, a movie audience is not used to having a bitter ending, a bitter bit ending. You know, they want they want your protagonist to to to, to win. But in Billy Halleck's case, yes, he's the lead, but he he did something very wrong. It's, it's, he, he he accidentally killed the Gypsy King's wife. That was an accident. But he used his position within the town's structure because he was an attorney to get off. Yeah. To get off from the manslaughter charge. And therefore, the Gypsy King cursed him. He was obesely overweight, and the Gypsy King said, thinner, and cursed him, and then he started to lose weight. And then he realizes he's cursed, and he has to find out how to break the curse before he starves to death. Yeah. And so, I mean, I thought that it's just a fascinating idea. Kudos exactly. to Stephen King for thinking of it. But since, but since Billy had, had sinned to begin with, by not accepting the fact that he'd done something wrong and taking his punishment, it had to have an unhappy ending. And what happens is Billy gets the gypsy king to take the curse off him. But of course, you can't really escape justice. There's always karma. Oh, and yeah. he gets the curse taken off him and put into a strawberry pie. And his wife's been cheating on him. And he knows his wife is going to get up in the morning and eat the pie. And it's his revenge on his wife. And she does. And she dies horribly. And then Billy's feeling terrific now, you know, because not only did he get off with from the crime, but he but he also got his vengeance on his unfaithful wife. And he comes downstairs to find the only person he loves, his 17 year old daughter has also had a piece of the pie. <laughs> and now, in order, he knows that in order to save his daughter, someone, probably him, has to take the curse back. Yeah. And at that moment, there's a ring at the door, 
and he opens it, and there is the guy who's been having the affair with his wife. <laughs> and he invites him in, and he gives him a piece of the pie, thereby saving his daughter and getting the ultimate revenge on his cheating wife and her lover. I mean, that's a sick story. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know. But so what happened was it was not a success in the theaters because people had difficulty with the ending, but nobody ever walked away from the film. Nobody found the film boring. Everybody found the film totally engrossing, but they, I think they had come to care for Billy because of Robin John, Robert John Burke's acting so much that they didn't want him to lose. I mean, you know, they'd taken him as the protagonist, so they wouldn't, they didn't like the ending. But then it hit, it hit cable and it hit the streamers, and it's never stopped getting fans since. So I'm glad to know that you found it affecting and enjoyable. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Thought it was really fun. And then, uh, final question uh, What's some advice you would like to give to upcoming filmmakers? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You know, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you all I can, all you, you just have to be able to just keep making films, just direct them, just write them. I mean, when I was coming up, it was, it was so hard because it was so expensive. It yeah. was prohibitively expensive and, and there was, there was just no way in. I, I got in through television commercials, but and you used to be able to do that. I, th I guess maybe you still can. Documentaries, television commercials, documentaries now are huge. The, uh, but all of that teaches you. But everybody finds their own way. The point is to keep working and to keep developing your skills. And the other thing, at least, at least in, in L.A., and, and then this means throughout North America, it's, it's relationships. And by that, I mean, if you're out working with other young guys on films, on shorts, on stuff you do in college together, they'll go on and get jobs. And if they like you and think you're good at what you're doing, they'll they'll recommend you. Yeah. And it becomes it becomes a web of relationships. And that takes you into, you know, uh, into into more work and. You can't, some are going to be great and some are not going to be great of what you do. But I mean, everything is a learning experience, you know, so that, in other words, there's no specific way except you keep working. And I, I know so many people in the horror community out here. I know that's how it works. What's that for? Because I, I see it working and I don't know about Holland, but, you know, I know about <laughs> LA. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for the advice. Uh, is there anything you would like to add to the interview? Yes. Go look for my books on Amazon. Tom Holland. I'm not the spider guy. I'm not the kid. <laughs> I'm the first Tom Holland, the original Tom Holland. The OG. Go look, go look on Amazon. Buy the notch. Buy my short stories, domestic disturbances. Wait for Fright Night, the trilogy coming up. Awesome. Thank you very, very much, Roger. Awesome. All the links will be in the description. So definitely go check out this Amazon page. Uh, and if you're still watching, thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you guys next time. See ya. Thank you, Roger.